cheer. Say, rebel against the world. Yo, it's a lot of craziness going on in some of these church circles, man. Yo, y'all wild. Hey, yo, who's me? We got to start calling names right here, man. <laughs> yeah. You will fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you might fall for anything. Snakes slither in the grass and they come with many schemes. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we hit them with the triple team. Yeah. You will fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you might fall for anything. Snakes slither in the grass and they come with many schemes. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we hit them with that triple team. I try to live my life with high morals. And it's a shame that where I'm from is not normal. Showing you the ancient ways like I use the time portal. And I serve the eternal God cause I'm mortal. You feel rejected, check out what the Father got for you. Listen to the gospel first before you say it's not for you. He owned in many mansions and he got a spot for you. But hurry and decide cause heaven is coming right for you. And he ain't got no love for none of us. And he's responsible for teaching every one of us. God of sin, now it's in each and every one of us. That's why the Son came to die for each and every one of us. The only question now is who you really gonna trust? In the wicked world standing for righteousness is sorta of tough. What they feed you in some churches isn't me, it's sorta of fluff. And me saying that has some is not like in this sort of stuff. Yeah. You will fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you might fall for anything. Snakes slither in the grass and they come with many schemes. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we hit them with the triple team. Yeah. You will fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you might fall for anything. Snakes slither in the grass and they come with many schemes. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we hit them with that triple team. You can't just take a man's word for it. Anything the Lord said, he had it written and recorded. When you listen to a sermon, the eloquence not important. People not reading the word is how the scripture got distorted. Yep, me and some friends had a falling out. Went to their church, everybody dancing and falling out. The preacher touching heads, blew his breath, and they all would shout. I looked at my man and said, for real, so what this all about? I can't believe this, and don't you try saying it's Jesus. Because it ain't, it's a classic case of Satan deceivers. Playing on the emotions is one of their favorite procedures. And all the theatrics is used to perform. Sway the believers that you're connected to the celestial essence, the blessed reverend who possess the weapons of heaven. I'm not convinced. I challenge the power you're professing. Too many of these false prophets are lying to the brethren. Real, real, real. Don't for that okie doke, fam. Real talk. It's a lot of evil being perpetrated in the name of our Lord and Savior, man. Beware the synagogue is safe. Got false angel of light and them false ministers of light. Gotta mimic the truth. Order to deceive you. Remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. You will fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you might fall for anything. Snakes slither in the grass and they come with many schemes. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we hit them with the triple team. Yeah, you will fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you might fall for anything. Snakes slither in the grass and they come with many schemes. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we hit them with that triple team. Here, what's good? What's cracking with y'all? Hold on, I'm trying to. I just, I'm glad it did that. Heard my phone going to young vibrate there. I don't want it doing that while I'm in, uh, while I'm in exposition mode. You're, hold on, hold on, y'all. Give me one second. My bad. I wanna, okay, there we go. There we go. Praise the Lord. Yo, what's poppin', man? God bless y'all. How y'all doing this evening? Salute, salute. You feel me? God bless y'all, man. Hey, it is a beautiful thing. Uh, blessed and honored one more time to get the opportunity provided by the Most High to come before the brothers and the sisters and to get it cracking out here for y'all. You feel what I'm saying? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Uh, let me go ahead and shoot over into the chat. Okay. Akish, what's good? Salute, Hebrew. What's good with you? Yes, yes. Brother Gary, salute, salute, bro. Brother Hashem, what it is? Brother Gregory Sharp, peace and blessings to you, King. Haha, <laughs> finally caught me live. Salute. Well, welcome, welcome. Uh, who else we got? These is all the YouTube family. Smitty, what's good with you, King? Pit to Palace, one love from Jamaica. What it is, Wagwan brethren, Wagwan. <laughs> Brother Christian, what's up? What's up? 
All right, let me look over here, see if anybody comment through, uh, commented on Facebook yet. Uh, no, no one has commented on the Facebook yet. Facebook is always a little more, um, it's, it, 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 even though I go live on Facebook simultaneously, uh, Facebook people aren't always, uh, that crowd isn't always as deep as the uh, YouTube crowd, but praise God. Um, what else we got? Ah, a just servant. Salute, salute. God bless. Welcome, welcome. So, hey, man, come on, man. It's your brother, uh, Zadok Ben Israel, aka the God Hop MC, hashtag just the best and nobody special, aka Young Chimney. Welcome to the dojo. The doors are open. Come on in. Take your shoes off, but make sure your sock game on point and get your warm up cottage on because it's about to get biblical and you know it. <laughs> But today, a little more extra biblical than biblical because of the topic. Oh, I see more bros coming in. Hold on. Let me see. KB, bring it out. Bring it out. That's what's up. Brother Bazell, Elephant Man Podcast Network. What's good, Bazell? Uh, peace and blessings to you and your house, King. Jeshurun. Shalom, shalom. Oh, this is your first time getting to catch a live lesson too. So we got two brethren who said they finally catching the live. Well, prayerfully, the live will not disappoint. Matt, if Yahoo, what it is, he says, Shalom, 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 Salama, Mishpaka. You done covered all the peace bases. <laughs> what up, fam? Arturo Vargas got a, hey, what up? Art, what's up, bro? Peace to you and my sister. Tell her, tell Ellie I said hello, man. God bless, bro. Glad you're here, man. Hope all is well. Um, so look, we're going to get into it tonight, y'all. This is part two of what I started Friday night. Um, I'm thinking there's going to probably be at least one to no more than two more parts to this. So tonight doesn't finish the series, but tonight is a continuation of what I started on Friday night. You feel me? So God bless y'all. I thank y'all for being here. If you are coming in through uh, through Facebook, salute to you. I ask that you would hit them thumbs up and them hearts help that algorithm. For those of you coming into YouTube, before you leave, I hope you will leave a thumbs up. If you leave a thumbs down, I won't be mad, but the thumbs up make me glad you heard. And make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell. So when I go live, in case you missed things, it'll let you know that I'm on. You know what I mean? You'll see it. So with that being the case tonight, I do want to continue into this uh, ethnic Israelites, this is part two, and this is also part two to one of uh, the subtitle, What Does DNA Prove? Now, last week where I started, I wanted you all to get the idea that <clears throat> while DNA is a uh, is, is one of the newer fields um, in, in science, and when I mean new, not that it came up last year, but it's only about it's the way they've been trying to use it outside of like, you know, uh, uh, um, like police solving murders and stuff like that or solving rapes, DNA in that sense, taking it to the other level to try and trace people's genealogy going back as far as they can. Um, that study is uh, in, in close to about 30 years. They've been trying to understand it, um, expand it get better at it and understand. And so I'm not trying to totally downplay that particular science, but just last week, for those of you who were here, I'm sorry, not last week, but Friday, for those of you who were here, I think we clearly established some basis to sit and consider that relying on DNA to tell you who is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, it's not as it's not as stable, it's not as solid a method to rely your arguments on. Now, the Hebrew Israelite community, as far as I perceive, does not make the crux of their argument when they're dealing with DNA. They don't try to say this. See, I got my DNA results, so it proves that. Um, I'm related to Joshua, the son of none. Like Hebrews don't, I don't see uh, Hebrews doing that. What Hebrews have used the genetic uh, science to show is that when my DNA has been compared with markers of DNA 
in other populations that are uh, uh, your test populations that exist today. My DNA matches up heavily with people here and here. And once you see that, you start to understand that there is a, a reason of a, a reasonableness to African Americans who, when they do their DNA genetic tests, see that they share blood and DNA markers with groups of people in West Africa and North Africa and even East Africa who claim to be the flesh and blood descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're not just claiming to be Jews. They are claiming to be from Gad. Some are claiming to be from Dan. Some are claiming to be Benjamin. Some of course are claiming Judah. Some are claiming Levi. In other places you'll find those who are claiming to be from Nas uh, Manasseh, Ephraim, Naphtali, Reuben. So Israelites aren't just claiming to be the Jews. You might have some who they, they just look at every, all people who were put on slave ships were the children of Judah. I don't believe that. I don't believe they can prove it. But with that being the case, all I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is, is that our DNA claims are to line us up with the people in Africa who it's undeniable that their oral traditions and that their a lot of their culture uh, found among them not only traces close but not fully to what people call Judaism, but their oral traditions, some of them even claim to, co uh, 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 to come from the land of Israel. They got stories on how they fled the Assyrian, uh, the Assyrian invasion of Northern Palestine, which was called Samaria at that time. And many of them fled into Judah. And then when the Assyrians defeated the Samaria nations, and were Samaritan nations and were coming to Judah toward Jerusalem. Many of them fled and ran into Egypt and ran into Libya. And some even went across the Sahara into sub-Sahara Africa, which is also called Ethiopia at times. And tonight we're going to put a little bit of that information on the table. All right. I see more people have popped in. Yo, salute. Ashton was good, fashionably late, but here. Well, I mean, bro, it's only 920 and I just started about 11 minutes ago. So you ain't too late. You heard. And I agree with you. Let's get them likes up, people. Let's get them likes up. Amen. So um, let me go ahead and get into this and let's see where it goes. So what I'm going to do right quick, let, hold on, let me share my screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to back up and I'm going to briefly recap using the first thing that I showed you all last, uh, uh, I keep saying last week <laughs> for, on Friday evening. So check this out, everybody. Check this out. Here we go. This is now. This is from Family Tree. This is Family Tree magazine, which is connected to one of the five biggest DNA companies in the world. Family Tree DNA is one. You got Ancestry, I think 23andMe. You got a couple others as well. But this article in Family Tree magazine is fact or science fiction, putting DNA rumors to the test, right? So let's go down. Okay, so they're gonna test the third rumor. You all see that on my screen? This is, it says, rumor three, DNA tests can pinpoint locations where your ancestors lived. Mm. Let's see what they say. It says status. Y'all see where it says status? Busted. DNA tests can pinpoint locations where your ancestors, ancestors lived. Locating your ancestors' tribe or location is the holy grail of genetic genealogy. Unfortunately, much like the Holy Grail itself, it is quite elusive. Even just the word ethnicity is enough to get some geneticists dander up, as there are conflicting opinions about what that word even means. 
As a result, a handful of factors stand in the way of ethnicity estimates being able to reveal where your ancestors lived in detail. Scientists can make inferences about your ancestry based on trends among populations, but they currently, meaning right now, with all of their technological advancements in the field, they currently can't say for sure that your ancestors lived in a specific country, much less a specific town. Now, it says the importance of movement. Some of the categories defined by DNA companies are purely geographical, like Northern Europe or the British Isles. Others are cultural, like Jewish or Inuit. As Shannon Combs Bennett points out in her webinar, What's Up With My Ethnicity Estimates, Ethnicity reports are based on a modern interpretation of ethnicity and culture. If your ancestors and their offspring had stayed in one geographic region and never allowed outsiders to enter, we could easily distinguish their DNA and yours from the DNA of people living in other regions. Over time, all of the inhabitants of your region would come to share specific genetic mutations, usually harmless changes in DNA. This would identify them as a distinct population in much the same way as a surname identifies members of a family, okay? But our ancestors didn't stay in one place. For thousands of years, humans have moved about, leaving their genetic imprints wherever they procreated. This makes it increasingly difficult for geneticists to distinguish one region's population from another's. Now, listen to this understanding reference population. So if any of you have ever taken a DNA test and you get it back, they have they are matching your genetic markers with people from referenced populations. What does that mean? Testing companies analyze a person's genetic makeup by comparing his or her DNA to a reference population of DNA samples from modern individuals living in various regions. So brothers and sisters, you could have people who's been living in a certain region for the last thousand years. That don't mean that's where they originally from. So if they line you up with some people and they kind of can see through uh, 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 through, uh, 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 um, through migration history and some histories of the people, they can say, hey, you share genetic markers with the people here. That don't mean that's where them people were 3,000 years ago. That's not what that means, but let's keep going. Check this out. It says, we are using modern day populations to help us make predictions about where our ancient ancestors lived. Now check, listen, the big five companies, 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, Family Tree DNA, uh, the namesake of the magazine article we're reading, people, Living DNA and My Heritage are doing their best to use statistical data in conjunction with historical information about populations and migrations <coughs> to give up these es to give us these estimates. Listen carefully. I want to make the screen bigger for this. Hold on. Oh, dang. my bad. Hold on, my bad, brethren. Uh, I, went, I, went, I went too far. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Look at this. It says uh, they're doing their best to, so they're looking at the DNA test and then they're trying to use historical information about populations and migrations to give us these estimates. But let me scroll up a little bit. They got they got this huge banner right here. So I, that, you only got the, uh, a small reading space. Look at this. But in the end, they are just estimates. Best guesses as to where you might find your ancestors thousands of years ago. Look, of the big five living, of the big five living DNA, comes the closest to pinpointing specific geographic regions for those with ancestry in the British Isles. They break down the United Kingdom into more than 40 geographic subregions, making it the only to provide that level of distinction, right? 
In a somewhat similar vein, Ancestry DNA offers an interesting view of your origins with its migrations tool. Migration groups show you where your ancestors were, not thousands of years ago, but between the years 1750 and 1900. Listen up. So by defining this timeline, they are often able to better deliver origin results that match up with what you already know about your family history. So if you don't know anything about your family history, then brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, it is all just a guessing game. And if you read earlier in the article, which I'm not going to do tonight, they make a claim saying, look, as an individual, your particular genetics can be traced back about 10 generations. That's it right now. So the level that their current technology is at can only take you back to the 1700s. They, their technology can't guarantee that you're related to any particular individual any further than that. Y'all know why? Because brothers and sisters, they don't have all the skeletal remains and the bones and the bodies of all the progenitors going back in time in order to compare you to. So they look at reference populations in the modern world. You see where people are in groups and clusters now, excuse me. They take samples from all over the world and then they start to tell you, hey, your DNA matches up with these people. And you can probably go back to about the 1700s and like pinpoint a possible person that you're related to. But once you try to go back and say, by genetic proof, an exact person that you're um, related to back in the year 300, like back during the Nicene Council or something, or in the first century with Christ in them and going way back beyond that, they can't do it. So I'm warning Hebrew Israelites who make their, who, and I'm not, I'm not against it. But Hebrew Israelites who make points to have a whole bunch of arguments about DNA, just make sure you keep your argument in the realm of, hey, I can prove I share genetic markers with people here. And once you study the people here, you can see that we find what? We find the the, the Hebrew Israelite ethnicity claim among all of these various people groups that I share DNA markers with. So there, I have as much reason to believe I'm possibly a Hebrew Israelite by blood as much as I would anyone who wouldn't claim that there and would claim to be whatever they would claim. But you, the United States government, nor the, somebody trying to argue against you can actually tell you genetically that you are or aren't related to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. They don't got no David. Jimmy. They are not sitting with David's uh, 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 DNA markers in, in the little vial somewhere. They don't got Solomon's markers, y'all. They don't have Aaron's markers. So even when this J marker of uh, 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 the Cohen or uh, 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 haplogripe or uh, 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 modal type, when they get into talking about that, even that J marker doesn't prove it's from Aaron. They 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 come to a conclusion. They believe, hey, this traces back to a common ancestor, and we saying this Aaron and Moses. But you can't prove it. You can't prove that. Let me go over back over over to the chat because I see a few more people have jumped in here. Who we got in here tonight? Uh, Vanessa Landis, welcome, shalom. Sister Amparo, how are you? Sister Pam, Sister Pam, what it is? Brandon Lewis said, I share the curses. Hey, even when you share the curses, hey, the children of Gibeon, the Gibeonites were a Canaanite tribe who became a, a, a servant people to Israel. When Israel suffered the curses, the Gibeonites suffered with them. So would the Gibeonites been able to prove that they were Hebrew Israelites just because they were under the curses? No, they would have been able to prove we are part of the nation of Israel even if we don't got their blood, but we are part of their nation. So when they suffer, we suffer, right? So 
Hey, hey, what up, Jack Hendricks? Jack Hendricks said my granddad was adopted, so proud of him. I have no idea. I'm European white, so I could be anything. Just like us, bro. Just like many of us. Skinny man, what it is, what it is. Shalom, shalom, King. So at the end of the day, no matter what it is, all we're going to do is share information that I, I didn't need it, but it just confirms what I already have faith in. Someone asked me, yo, someone asked me, well, what is it that, how can you for sure say you're Hebrew Israelite? I say, bro, as sure as I can say that Isaac really was Abraham's son and really lived on the earth, and I have no physical proof of it, except the traditional claims that come from the people for thousands of years. I read it in the scripture. I have faith that Isaac really existed. So with that same faith, I believe that I'm an Israelite. I believe the curses fit our people and even the migration patterns in the oral traditions that we find all around the world, all in Afghanistan, all in Tibet, all of these cats over here claiming that they Manasseh and Reuben and Naphtali, some even claiming they Issachar. When the last time you heard a Jewish person claim to be from the tribe of Issachar? Hmm. Anybody? When the last time you heard a Jewish person say, no, we're, we're claiming we're Issachar. You'll never hear Issachar's ge ge genetics. Where's What's the Issacharite moto haplotype? Hmm? What's the tribe of Naphtali's Y chromosome marker so that you know that somebody is really from the tribe of Naphtali? Hmm? Brothers and sisters, it is smoke and mirrors when people argue it with definitiveness. I don't depend on no genetic test for my claim to the nation of Israel. As deep as everything I believe is in me, that's just there. And I have my historical research and even genetics that give me comfort of the strength of the possibility. And any of you who have watched me in interviews about this, I said, yo, and I'm to the point, and, and this was years ago I came to this point, if I got a DNA test that existed that would say you are 0.1% Israelite by blood, now I'm just... Uriah. What do you mean, Zadok? Uriah died as a soldier for the army of Israel. He was a Hittite by blood, but he left his people and joined Israel to the point he was willing to fight and die. So when, even though Uriah the Hittite, that name lets you know he come from the Hittite people, he wasn't an Israelite by blood. He was one of David's mighty men and David did him wrong. We believe David did a godly man wrong. A man who was willing to fight against the enemies of Israel and chop heads for the inheritance. You understand what I'm saying? Then at the least, I'm him. At the least, I am Ruth. Who, the Moabitess come from Lot's descendants who told Naomi, look, your people is now my people and your God is now my God. I'm, I see either way, I'm rolling with Israel. So how about that? Hmm? You don't like it? You don't like it? That's a you problem, not me. <laughs> hey, salute. Brother Joe, what's good, bro? God bless. Pastor Renice, hello, Miss Kirkland. How art thou? God's ride or die chick. I'm here to grow in knowledge. Thank you for the insight. Well, hopefully I can be helpful in that. So welcome, welcome. If you just join it, those of you on Facebook, remember to hit them thumbs up and them hearts and help that algorithm. And for those of you on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button and remember to subscribe to the page and hit that notification bell. And last but not least, if you'd like to give a monetary donation to the ministry right there on the ticker at the bottom of the screen, it shows you the ways to do it. You feel me? So let me go ahead and get into this. So I just read that. Now, what I want to do is this. Last week, I'm, I keep saying last week, forgive me. Friday evening, I shared some information breaking down how the Levites were moving and how they were having children all over the place, right? Now I want to, and that was out of the scripture, but now I want to go to something else. Hold on for a second here. I want to read the scripture and I want to show you something. Let's go in our Bibles 
over to the book of Zephaniah. Let's go to Zephaniah. Let me pull up the Bible. Okay. Let's go to, to the book of Zephaniah. Hold on for a second, everyone, as we get there. Zephaniah. Okay. There we go. Chapter three. Come on. Oh, there we go. Let me actually make that a little bigger. Okay. Uh, hold on for one second, brethren. So, as you can see, we're going to read something out of the prophet Zephaniah here, and it talks about the Most High's plan on when he's going to start to bring the children of Israel back home for the final time, okay? I want you all to pay attention to something that the Most High says here in his word. This is the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, okay? And when we get there, I'm going to skip down, and here it goes. Verse 8, therefore wait ye upon me, saith Yah, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Amen. <laughs> Skinny man said, Amen. Listen to this. If I'm not an Israelite, I'm going to die on sight for him. Hey, it was a whole bunch of cats who was willing to do that. You had some Edomites who joined the armies of Israel in the days of David and them. And they were, they, they were, hey, when you look at David's 30 mighty men, I think if I'm not mistaken, five of them were not ethnic Israelites. They left their people and joined Judah. You understand? So I would consider them brother. Because once they got themselves circumcised and came under the covenant, the Lord said, you shall treat them like one of you, like one born in the land. You treat them like, like an Israelite born after that. So that's how you just deal with it. Okay, it says, for then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of Yah to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliance, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring my offering. What does it mean beyond the rivers of Ethiopia? So not that that's the only place, but why is the most high, per in other places he talk about bringing them from beyond Pathros and cushion that, but why is he, why does he say it like this? I want to bring up another text uh, right quick, brethren. Let's go over to Amos chapter nine. I know a lot of you know this text. Amos 9. Amos 9. Look at this. And the Lord God, this is uh, Amos 9 and verse 5. And the Lord God of hosts is he that touched the land and it shall melt and all that dwell therein shall mourn and it shall rise up wholly like a flood and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. Yah is his name or Yahuwah is his name. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Why the most high feel like he need to say it to Israel like that? What? How does he look at the Ethiopians for him to say to the children of Israel, aren't you just like the Ethiopians to me? Say if the Lord, have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kir? Brothers and sisters, why is the most high talking like this? I, 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 let me go to another source here. I want to back. I want to go over right quick to. um, Yeah. Let me bring this up. Let me share my uh share the screen again. Look at this. 
Where did he say he was going to bring them from? I want you all to look at this right quick. Let me make this bigger. Okay, brothers and sisters, look at this. It says this. It says, now, now look, the traditions go that the children of Israel, hold on, let me make this bigger, okay. Now, the children of Israel, brothers and sisters, would claim to come from, uh, okay, so you got the Mediterranean. So the children of Israel can come from this little strip right here, this little strip that today they call the Sinai Peninsula. This little strip, you got Arabia over here, you got the what's, what they call the Red Sea. Over here is what they call the Arabian Sea. And then up here is the Mediterranean. This all this is the coastline. This up here is Egypt and Libya, right? I'm going to back out a bit. Egypt and Libya. You see here it says Sahara or the Great Desert. So Sahara, the Great Desert is right here. Now, if you once you cross the Sahara, you come out of Egypt or over here is Libya and you cross the Sahara, you come into Sudan to over here is Somalia and right here is Ethiopia. And on this old map, do you do you see what they call? Oh, no, 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 no. Look at all of this. All of this here at one time was considered Ethiopia because when these maps were put together, all of Africa still hadn't been explored by the Europeans, right? Now, check this out. I want to show you another one. Look at this. Yo, Asta, I seen that, bro. Talk about, hey, skinny, man. Tell me that fell out your pocket, man. Do you all see this here? You probably can't see it because this picture isn't the clearest, but it says A-T-H-I-O-P. This is Athiop. This is the Greek way of saying Ethiopia because actually Ethiopia is English, is an English version of the Greek word Athiop. The Greeks are the ones who named this whole region Athiop. And also look here. You see, you see here, this would be Kim, Egypt here, and then all of this that people call the Sahara or Sub-Sahara, all of this is considered Libya. I want you to remember that. And, oh, and what do they call the ocean on this map? This isn't called the Atlantic Ocean on this map. This is called, today what we call the Atlantic Ocean? At one time was called Oceanus Ethiopicus. It at once it at one time was called the Ethiopian Ocean. How many of you know that near Africa it wasn't called the Atlantic Ocean, but it was called the Ethiopian Ocean? Why would they be calling that that? Because brothers and sisters, today what we call the gold, well, what used to be called the Gold Coast, but it's like where Ghana and all of that is. At one time, all of that was considered Ethiopia. When you think of these places, we talk about these places by modern boundaries. The modern map that made Ethiopia smaller is something that was done by the British and the French and the Spanish. So Africa being 54 countries, that's not historically accurate. That's something that happened in the late 1800s, brothers and sisters. So I had to go to an older source. I got one more for y'all. Look at this. Here. I like this one. Look at this. So you see how this here, which is, is Guinea, and then down here you got Congo. Brothers and sisters, all you see how all of this was considered Ethiopia at one time? You see that? All of this was Ethiopia at one time. 
And that's why on old maps, the what you would call the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean was named the Ethiopic, the Ethiopian Ocean. That's important. Why? Because when we, what did we just read? The Most High saying Amos. Let me go back to the other map. Go back to, I'm, I'm going to go back to this map. He says, he's talking to Zion and Amos. The land of Israel is right here. Hopefully y'all can see my cursor moving around. It's right here. This is where uh, the land of Israel is. You come down. So when he say from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, I'm going to bring my children back to Zion. The most high is telling you all of this down here. This is central and western Africa. I'm bringing the children of Israel. How did they get there? The most high sent them there through captivity and escaping trying to escape invasion they became exiles it's the same thing you're exiled or either taken captive either way the most high has put you out of the land so brothers and sisters once again when he says i'm bringing my children what was that text let's go read that one more time let me share this let me go right back and share the uh the screen hold on What does that say in verse seven? What did God say to Israel? Are you not like the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? And then what did we read the Most High said? When we were in Zephaniah, let me go back to Zephaniah right quick. What was that? The book of Zephaniah chapter three. What did the Most High say in verse 10? He said, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring my offering. What is my dispersed? Those who have been put out the land, they're going to come back to me, even from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Right here in prophecy, God is letting you know the location, not of every Israelite tribe, but of many in Israel because they have to come from these geographic locations back to the land. From where? From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. One more time for the road. Where are the rivers of Ethiopia located? There we go. Y'all see that? I'm going to make that a little bigger. Children of Israel coming from here. You can't see it probably because of how blurry and small it would look on your screen. But right here where my marker is, it says Jerusalem. Coming from Palestine. When, yo, when the Assyrians invaded, it's not even on the map. But all up here, they came from all in this region. If this map was the whole thing, all up here, y'all see where my mouse is on the computer screen? They would come from this direction into Israel. When the Assyrians came to invade the land, many of the 10 tribes ran and ran down south to Judah. And then as the Assyrians came closer to, towards Judah, where Jerusalem is, they many of them ran down here into Arabia. And many went this way into Egypt and into Libya. And they crossed the Sahara. And where did they wind up? Beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. That is not the only place the children of Israel went. But many of us on slave ships, our mothers and fathers, came out of Guinea, came out of Luango. You, Hey, y'all can't see it. You see right here where this arrow of Ethiopia, this little pink area is Luango. You got Bifra up here. This down here is where uh, uh, West Guinea, which today we call this Ghana and all of that. This is where the slave ships came from. 
past the rivers of Ethiopia to some people that don't matter. It matters to me. Why? Because the Hebrew Israelite ethnic claim, especially when we start talking about um, the, uh, 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 the DNA markers, the Hebrew Israelites, like shout out my bro Dante Fortson and Benaya Israel and them, they're not arguing about the genetics prove who we exactly come from 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. No, the DNA, y'all read it, the DNA test that many brethren are taking and then they sharing the results live on uh, Facebook and YouTube doing whole lives like I'm doing now. They're showing you, yo, this is telling me I'm sharing genetic markers with people from here and from here and uh, 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 Ethiopian Jews and Yemenite Jews. I got limba markers that I share with the, from them uh, 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 from the Bantu um, tribes. Then you got the cats in more Western and Central Africa and many of these groups, not all, but we share genetic markers, y'all, with groups of people in Africa who look just like us, who claim for centuries that they are the children of Israel and that and their oral traditions, which go back generations, have stories. They're not claiming, oh, we the try. Some claim to be Judah, but some claim to be Dan. There's a great history on how the land Sudan today in Africa was named by Shemites from the tribe of Dan who founded that land because it was unsettled when they ran there uh, in the late, 6th century BC, 600 years before the times of Christ, they claimed to have come into that land and they named it after their father, Dan. That's the claim of some people there who claim to be the children of Israel. And that and, and that 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 oral tradition, they they circumcise their children on the eighth day. They keep the Sabbath. They 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 have sacrifice rituals still where they sacrifice clean animals according to the dietary law. They eat according to the dietary law and they do all of this and they don't even have Torah scrolls. How are these people keeping all of this and they ain't even got copies of the Torah, all of them? Some of them didn't get copies of the Torah until they came into contact with European and, and, and Edomite uh, Palestinian Jews doing research as they hearing about these claims of blacks in the interior of Africa claiming that they're this and they brought them Bibles and brought them Torahs. And so when some of them started to read Torah, they adopted other practices. But before they had contact with the outside world, when they met them, they were already doing these things and have been carrying. They was like, where did you get these traditions from? These been handed down to us from our ancestors. These the, the, these are the tradition, you know, the traditions of our fathers. What you want me to say about it? You know what I mean? Hey, if you just coming in, welcome. It's your brothers at Akban Israel, aka the God Hopham C. We already in the building. Come on into the dojo and get your warm up cottage started because we already biblical and extra biblical too. Hey, yo, I would adjure you. God bless you. If you would like to support the ministry financially, look at the ticker on the bottom of the screen and get it in. If you got it in, you understand? Get it in. If you got it in, you heard. <laughs> so, hey, let me uh, move on here. What do I want to bring up now? Oh, here we go. This is what I want to bring up. Now, I want to start to show who the children of Israel as Semites were among. So the, the Most High said, you're going to bring my children from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. There's somebody I want us to read about right quick. I'm going to bring the Bible back up one time. I want, to, I want us to go to the book of Isaiah chapter 37, right? Yeah, Isaiah 37. Let me share the screen right quick. Okay, Isaiah 37. Okay, so the book of Isaiah, chapter 37, 
And when we get there, I'm going to read at what verse? Okay. So you got the children of Israel. Look, verse five. So the servants of King Hezekiah, who was king of Judah at the time, came to Isaiah. This is the prophet. And Isaiah said to them, thus shall you say to your master, thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now, the, 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 the Assyrian army had conquered the territory of the 10 tribes by this time. So Judah is left without anyone to, to, to protect them. They're going to have to, Judah, Benjamin, Judah and Benjamin going to have to fight on their own if it, if it comes down to it. And Hezekiah is afraid. The Lord lets Isaiah know, tell him he going to be all right. The king of Assyria basically ain't going, I'm not going to let him touch Judah. But look at this, verse eight. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And he heard say concerning Terhaka, king of Ethiopia, he has come forth to make war with thee. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah saying, thus shall you speak to the king Hezekiah of Judah saying, let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee saying Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the, uh, of, Assyria, of the king of Assyria. So at the end of the day, this is war talk back and forth. But who is Terhaka, the king of Ethiopia? I, let me, let's read about young Hark. All right. We about to read about young Hidden Hark. Let me take y'all to another... Uh, screen here on the bible i mean not here on the bible here on uh here on my screen let me take y'all to another extra biblical source let's end that okay let me take you over to another screen right quick hey if you liking this share this out and let people know to come on up in here because we in young eddie mode tonight which means edification by the way all right so what's wh where am i at this is encyclopedia.com. Terhaka, okay? The king of Cush, who according to the Bible, took part in Hezekiah's revolt against Sennacherib. These references to Terhaka, the fourth pharaoh of the 25th Ethiopian dynasty, appear to be an anachronism. According to a careful interpretation of, of, those pro of the problematical biblical passages in the Syrian inscriptions, Hezekiah's uprising started in 703. So they have historical proof to date that the Bible is telling the truth that this happened, but they're saying that they used Terharka's name in place of his brother. So it was still Terharka's family, but it was his brother. But brothers and sisters, the Bible does this a lot. For instance, I'll give you an example in case many of you don't know about this. In our Bibles, you got the guy Belshazzar, who is king of Babylon? Remember the, remember the, the infamous handwriting on the wall. That is a, a, a representative of the king. That remember that night he had the festival and he did this evil before God's sight and he had them bring in the golden cups and stuff from the temple and he was drinking out of them and wilding. And it says a hand appeared out of nowhere and wrote on the wall and it's many. Many to care ufar sin, right? That's where the famous uh, 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 idiom, the handwriting's on the wall. That's where that comes from. But we get that out of the book of Daniel. Belshazzar, the book tells you he was the king of Babylon. He was, but technically when you read history, he wasn't king alone. He was co-king. He was really prince. But his father crowned him king and left him in charge of the city, Babylon. But his father was the true king, Nabonidus. And he was 60 miles away fighting a Persian assault on their borders. So when Babylon got taken, if you study extra biblical history, the last fight wasn't the Persians took Babylon and that was that. 
That night, Belshazzar was murdered by some of his own guards. They gave the army, the military inside of the city of Babylon gave up and the Persians took Babylon without having to kill anybody. Then they marched and fought war with Belshazzar's father, who was also king, and his name is Nabonidus. But in the Bible, it just say Belshazzar the king. So the Bible isn't lying when it says Terharka, king of the Ethiopians, but he was one of the princes during that time, but he became sole king about 20 years later. But at this time, his brother was also one of the princes controlling the part of Ethiopia. So the Bible isn't lying. It's not problematic. But anyway, I, but see, if you don't read and study history, then some of these things can be like, well, does it make a difference? Well, yeah, be, it makes a difference in case someone would try to bring that kind of information up to you. But anyway, let me get back to the task at hand. It says, uh, so they got Assyrian records proving that there was a revolt from the king of Judah, Hezekiah. So we know Hezekiah is a real guy in history. He really was king of the Jews, uh, of Judah, and, and controlled Jerusalem and, and led a revolt against the Assyrian king, Sennacherib. It says, Sennacherib undertook a successful punitive expedition against Judah's Philistine and Egyptian allies in 701, two years later, and then besieged all the fortified cities of Judah ultimately forcing Hezekiah to pay a heavy indemnity, meaning he paid a tax. But the Lord, they didn't take Jerusalem, like the Lord said. The appearance of Terharka at the head of another Egyptian contingent only served to cause Jerusalem to be immediately besieged a second time, although the siege was interrupted because of a plague in the Assyrian camp. Wow. Okay. Sennacherib, nevertheless, again, made Hezekiah and Judah his vassals. In the light of the above mentioned dates, the Pharaoh who thus unsuccessfully assisted Hezekiah can only have been Terharka's brother and predecessor, Shabiktu, Shabikku, the Sithos of Herodotus' account of the uh, Assyrian expedition. The Bible references Terharka, king of Cush, however, are not inappropriate since the citations symbolize the historical role of the entire Ethiopian dynasty. Okay, Zadok, well, why did you feel we needed to know to who Young Hark was? Because I want to show you all something. Let me go here right quick to this source, pull up another source for you all. <laughs> what did these Ethiopians what do they look like? Let me bring this up. Okay. So, oh, hold on. Wrong source. Hold on, everybody. Oh, here we go. This is the one I want. Okay. <laughs> Let me uh, share the screen again. Look at this. Let me make this. Let me make the screen a little bigger. All right. Y'all see that picture? What is that a picture of? What that look like to y'all? Here we go. Illustration of Ethiopian prisoners of Ramesses II. This sketch is from ancient Egypt during the time of Ramesses II. It depicts Ethiopian prisoners chained to one another around their necks. And you got one prisoner on the far left who also has his elbows tied up, right? So I just want to, and look at this. All of these are Ethiopian, considered Ethiopian warriors. So Taharka would have came looking similar to these guys in skin tone and this, that, and the third. But notice this, they, some of the Kushites are dark are very dark skinned. And then y'all see some of them are light. They, they're not as dark. They're more brown skinned. So even all those who were 
of this, let's say, Ethiopian conglomerate of different tribes of Ethiopia. They weren't all burnt black, per se, for, for lack of better expression. You see that some of them were lighter, but the, no one is going to deny that they're what? Men of color. So th this is kind of what the forces in, in pigmentation and skin color and stuff who came to assist the children of Judah in their fight against the uh, 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 the Assyrian onslaught. This is similar to what they would have looked like. OK, I just wanted to share that with you all. But I got another source. Hold on. I got something else that I want to share here. Oh, let me get that off. Let me get that off the screen. OK. I want to bring this up right quick. Share the screen again for another source. Now, this is from, uh, uh, um, dang, what's the name? Hold on. I forget their name. Hold on. I got, this is from a seminary, a seminary website, Grace Communion Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina, right? And, uh, and this is one of their PhDs. This is, uh, so this is coming out of a seminary school, right? Bump City said they got my man all jammed up, <laughs> But I want you all to look at this. This is called Evidence of Black Africans in the Bible by Dan Rogers. Now, I'm going to make this bigger. Okay, look at this. Here. Y'all see that picture? Y'all see that? I'm going to make it even bigger. Because I don't want to read the whole article. Go read it on your own time. You see this picture? Who, who, who are these people? Where did this picture come from? This is from the tomb of Ramesses the third. Different nationalities shown in dealings with Egypt. Y'all see how they look? These are all people of color. You can see here the second the second individual from the left is much darker than the rest. The first gentleman is a little lighter hue. The gentleman to the far right is of a lighter hue. And then you see the two, the uh, third and the fourth are a little bit lighter in complexion than them all. But what are we looking at here? This first gentleman on the left is a Libyan. Remember the map I showed y'all where the Libyans were? So just because you were in Africa, no one is saying that the Libyans, we know that the Libyans are a um are, 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 are descendants of Ham. Libya, foot, blood, like these are the descendants of Ham. And notice they're not just dark, dark at all. Like who, who is the second gentleman? A Nubian, the sons of Cush, closer to the Ethiopian people. So the Libyan is African. The first gentleman, that's an African, y'all. The second gentleman, African or Hamitic. The, the third gentleman is a Syrian. This gentleman is a Bedouin coming more out of Arabia. And then you got the fifth person. This represents a Hittite. So you see that the Hittites were a more of a brown skinned hue people. While the Ethiopian, while the Nubian was darker, and then in the middle you got the Syrian and you have the Bedouin. I wanted to show that picture, and this comes out of uh, Ramesses the Third's temple. Um, now, I mean his tomb. I want to give you another source. Hold on. These are things to just show you how some of these people looked. Uh, brothers and sisters. Now, here we go. Let me share the screen again. Salute to the room. If you're just joining, it's your brother, the God Hop MC. We getting it in tonight with part two here. Now, look at this. 
No thanks. What, what site is this? Ancient Origins, reconstructing the story of humanity's past. This is ancientorigins.net. Now, what is this? This is from, this is uh, from, uh, well, it was least updated July 26, 2019 by Brian Hill. Let me make the screen bigger. Okay. Here we go. The Amorites, when the children of Israel fought, came into the land out of Egypt, who were the two nations that they had to fight on the one side of Jordan? And Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh got that as their territory. They had to fight the Amorites, right? The Amorites are a Canaanite people. Look at this. The Amorites, also called Amuru or Martu, were an ancient Semitic speaking people who dominated the history of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Palestine from about 2600 B 1600 BC. When the Lord told Abraham, I believe it was his dream in Genesis 15, he said, when I bring your children back, I'm going to bring them after the sins of the Amorites have completed. So God told Abraham, once I put your children, uh, once they become oppressed in the land where they are strangers and then people are going to oppress them, I'm going to bring them out with great substance. But I'm going to wait till the fourth generation to bring them out because the sins of the Amorites are not finished. Brothers and sisters, what did the Amorites look like? Tribal nomads who forced themselves into the lands that they needed. The Amorites were reputedly fierce warriors. They twice conquered Babylon and Mesopotamia, establishing new city states, the most famous which, of which became Babylon. Their most noted king, Hammurabi, was the first king of the Babylonian Empire. So guess what? People talk about the Hammurabi codes. Hammurabi was an Amorite. But look at this. Here. Y'all see this picture? See that? Hold on. Let me see. I might be able to make it even one step bigger. Yes. You all see that? What is this? What are we looking at, Zadok? Well, this is a compilation of the glass and faience inlays depicting traditional enemies of ancient Egypt found at the royal palace adjacent to the temple of Medinet Habu from the reign of Ramesses III. The reputation, the representations are in order. Look at in order. A pair of Nubians. Y'all see that? So these first two here, the very darkest ones, are two Nubians. The third individual is a Philistine. Look at how dark the Philistine is. Y'all see that? The third individual, the Philistine. You see how the Philistine looks? You can't even confuse. So when David fought Goliath and it says the Philistines encamped in the valley and Israel was afraid of them and they fought this war, what did they possibly look like? I'm not saying it wasn't no light-skinned Philistines people, but understand, y'all understand the point I'm making. Here, let, let's keep going. The next person, this lighter than the brown-skinned gentleman, this is an Amorite. Now, of course, we're looking at a glass relief. The next is a Syrian... And the last gentleman is a Hittite. So we know that the children of Israel had to fight all these last four in order to conquer the land of Canaan. And when you look at the first two, the first two represent a people group who at certain times became allies with Israel when they fought against Babylon and the Assyrians. I'm showing this because the African and Levant region or today, which they call the Middle East, the Palestine area, were heavily populated by people of color. And we got the historical proof right here. I don't care what no DNA genetic test say, but see, a DNA genetic test can't take you back all this far and tell you what all these people exactly look like. So we don't just rely on DNA. We rely on historical evidence. These painted 
release from the Egyptians get us close to being able to see what the skin pigmentation and look of these of these people groups possibly would have been. The, it, it, yo, Matif Yahoo, right, bro? Right? So I want to take you all somewhere else. Here we go. I want to show you a picture from the 6th century CE. I, I, I want us all to look at something right quick. Okay, here we go. Let me make this larger. Come on, man. What you doing? Get larger for the kid. There we go. I'm about to be like, yo, what in the world are do you got us looking at? Okay. <laughs> Let me share the screen again. Uh hold on. This time. Okay. Uh Okay. Hold on for a sec, brother. Let me get out of there. Let me get out of there. Okay. Hold on, brethren. Did I just close? Hold on, y'all. I just, I, I just closed my screen. Ulan, Sian. Ulan. Let me open this back up. Sorry for the delay, everybody. But be patient. I'm up here trying to get it in. Open this back up. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and share my screen now. Thank you all for your young patience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, what am I going to do? You know what? I'm going to share the entire screen here. Uh, boom. Bring you all here. Okay. So now, brethren, I want you to look at this. You all see this pic right here? Y'all wondering what that is. What this is, is this is an example of some Jewish art from the 6th century CE. So this is roughly about 1,400 years ago, right? Uh, yo, I didn't even see that. A salute. And thanks for that. Over there in the chat, y'all see uh, Brother uh, Tyrone. No, I said Brother Tyrone. I'm calling him Tyrone. Uh, but I see Tyrone in his message. It says, have you seen the picture of Abraham that looks like Tyrone from down the block? Although it was done around 300 during the Roman captivity of Israel. He said, I fell out my chair. Oh, please send that. And A, hey, and thanks for the donation. Hey, y'all, and follow uh, XP's um, example and go ahead and, you know, you can leave a donation in the super chat. You can hit us through um, a, a PayPal and Cash App as well. A hey, salute, family. Thank you so much. But look at this. Let me go back to, let me go back here. So what, it, what are we looking at here? Now, this is from 300 years after what bro was just referring to. It says here, this is the picture of Isaac's, Isaac being sacrificed. It comes from the Beth Alpha Synagogue in the Jezreel Valley from around the 6th century, right? So let me show you a better picture of this. Okay, you all see this right here? You see this pic? Now, this is supposed to be Abraham right here at the right. He got a knife in his right hand in front of you. Then he's holding in his hand little Isaac. Here is supposed to be the ram caught in the bush. Up here is, a, is the hand of God that's it's supposed to symbolize the hand of God appearing from heaven saying, stop, don't kill the child. And right here are the two servants that went with Abraham. Now, of course, brothers and sisters, we're not, th these aren't like the Egyptian wall reliefs. 
But I went here because if you notice, they are they are depicted as being brown skinned. You see that Abraham, I the little baby Isaac is brown or the boy Isaac and the two servants, one is golden haired and one is more brown haired, but they're both people of color. This is from the year 600 in the Jezreel Valley in the church. This is a big picture on the floor of the church and it depicts this. And I just want to say for the record, y'all see the goat's face? Yeah, somebody did let a kid draw this, huh? But this is really some great art because it's a whole bunch of ceramic tile on the floor turned into a picture. So that it is really skillful when you think about it. <coughs> Pardon me. It's not drawn. This is done by putting little ceramic blocks together and it's a whole floor. So it is pretty skillful. But look at this. I want to point out something. Y'all see the ram's face? Y'all see this? The ram's face. The ram's face is, the ram's body is brown, but it's a lighter brown than the skin and the faces of the people. And the ram's face is white. Y'all see that? The ram's face is left to depict. It has a white face and it has a, a brownish body. But I want to point out, he said, zoom in. I don't, I'll try to zoom in. Let me see. Okay, may, hopefully this is better, y'all. So this right here, this is Abraham. This is Isaac to the to the far right. Then you come over here and you got the two servants with Abram. Then you got the goat in the middle, the ram in the bush. See the horns on the ram? But look at the ram's face. His face is white. If they wanted to depict these as being more Caucasian looking individuals, they would, their face, that their skin tone would have been left closer to this or like to their clothes, which are white robe. See how the ram's body is a brownish, but the brown of the humans is a darker brown than even the brown furriness of the goat. So, yeah, the words are in like uh, some Hebrew script there. But I just wanted to show that to you all because I wanted to show you that even when you go into the into something like that, you can see that they actually depict them at least with pigmentation. They're colorful. They didn't leave them like, yo, literally, if you, and I'm going to be fair, because in the sixth century, now that's in Israel, in Jezreel Valley. If you see a depiction of Abraham in Greece or in Europe in the sixth century, it's no mistake that the artists, depicted them looking Caucasian over there. Like I, I didn't, I didn't want to bring it in here, but the, I got pictures of the apostles and of Moses and David in them that you find in churches and stuff in Europe and in Greece at that same time. And the Europeans decided to paint the patriarchs looking like themselves. But when you in Israel in the Jezreel Valley, you actually can see that this sixth century painting in the land of Israel depict them as more a, a, a people of color. We've seen the Hittites, the Amorites, uh, uh, the Philistines, and the Ethiopians all depicted as different shades, the Ethiopian being the darkest. But remember the first Ethiopian picture I showed you? The first one with the four Ethiopian soldiers who were caught, you had the dark ones, then you had the more the lighter ones who were more of a brown skin. Y'all see that? So I'm just showing you that this is who the children of Israel were surrounded by. And the Hittites were Semitic, right? I want to go to something right quick. I want to show you all something. Look at this. Hold on. So remember Libya? Remember I showed you one picture with the Libyans in it? Hold on for a second, brethren. Check this out.
Look at this. Hold on. Okay, so we know who the Hebrews fought. Okay, so here. By, that's where I wanted to go. BibleGateway.com. I wanted to sh bring you all to the children of Elam, the Elamites. I'm going to make this screen bigger. Okay. Let me make it even bigger so you all can see the words, hopefully. Yes. Okay, let me share the screen one more again. Okay. Bang. Now here we go. Let me share the screen. Be patient with me, y'all, because I I, I want to share it correctly so you all can see correctly. Salute, salute. What up, Abishai? So here we go. Elamites. Who are the Elamites? Elam, uh uh, hold on. Okay, the Elamites, the biblical record traces the Elamites back to Elam, a son of Shem. Scholars classify, classify, them, classify them as non-Semitic Caucasians. Yeah, okay. Archaeology and anthropology shed no particular light upon Elamite origins, but it is clear that Elam, influenced by the Jemdet Nasser culture during the later period of the fourth millennium B.C., the dependence culturally of Elam upon Mesopotamia that began in this early period lasted through her entire history. Elam's earliest appearance, appearance in Mesopotamian records show it in subjection to the Sumer in the time of Lagash in, 25th, in uh, 2450. This further strengthened the influence of Sumer culture upon the Elamites. Elamite dependence on upon Mesopotamia continued after the hegemony and the Tigris Euphrates Valley shifted from the Sumerians to the Akkadians under Sargon. So check this out. It was in this period that the Elamites appropriated the Sumero Akkad cuneiform script with which they produced their, their, their uh, inscriptions on clay tablets and stones. Elamites from Susa participated in the building of the temple of Gudeo, uh, 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 Gudea. Of, uh, uh, of Lagash. Now, let me go down. Hold on for a second. <clears throat> you got the Elamites at Susa and they become a part of, here we go. That's This is what I want. Elam, the progenitor of the Elamites with Asher, our facts at Lud and Aram. A son of Shem. Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, is described as overlord of three other Mesopotamian kings. That's in Genesis. That's uh, one of the individuals who were uh, who Abraham helped fight against the kings of um, uh, 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 the king, helped the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fight against. Cuneiform tablets discovered at Moriah indicate that in this period, Elamite mercenaries served in the armies of the kings of Mesopotamia and that the Elamites traveled as emissaries as far as Aleppo and Hazor, which may help us to understand Genesis 14. Look at this. So I want to I want to skip down. It says Elam is listed among those who attack Jerusalem and is described as a land of archers. It is also listed with the Medes among the attackers of Babylon under Cyrus. Elam is also listed as one of the places to which the Israelites were exiled. Also, uh, here we go. The episodes recorded in the book of Esther occur at Susa, which is the ancient capital of Elam in the reign of Ahasuerus, the Persian king, who is identified by some as being Xerxes I. 
the Elamites are said to have been present along with Parthians, Medes, and others in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Okay, Zadok, why is that important? I want to show you all something. Hold on for one second here. Uh, let me bring this up. Hold on for one second, brethren. Just be patient because it's good. Hopefully this is edifying to you all. If you all are, 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 are getting some good understanding out of this, I would like you all to uh, just leave a one. Let me know what y'all thinking. How are y'all actually looking at this per se? Hey, XP, you see my, my email address right there on the ticker? Your boy Zadok at Gmail. Just look at the ticker going across the bottom of the screen, bro. And you can send that to me now. Let me know when you do it. See, I'm opening up my email right here on screen. Okay. Ah, I didn't. You know what? <clears throat> Pardon me. I didn't put my one joint in here, but it's okay. Do you all see this? Y'all know what this is? These are th these are called the immortal guard of the Persian army. I want y'all to look at this. Y'all see these boys? The immortal guards of the Persian army. Do y'all know who these are? These are Elamites. What did we read? What did we just read that the Bible says the children of Elam come from? They are Shem. Shemites, you might have some Shemites who are light, lighter skinned. But here, the children of Elam who come from one of Shem's sons. So these are grandsons of Shem. How come Shem got these black grandsons depicted on the walls of Babylon and of Susa, the capital of the ancient Persian empire? Let me show you something else. So look at this. Let me show you the sphinxes of Look at this. Do y'all see how they depicted themselves? Look at the gods. When they depict, depict the soldiers with the sphinx and with the wings, do y'all see that? These are Shemitic. Understand. These are Shemites. These are Shemites. Elamites were a part of the Persian. I see uh, good information, Matthew Yahoo. The Elamites themselves were part of the Persian, um, the part of the Persian military, but the Elamites themselves are descendants of Shem, according to our Bibles, right? So when you look at this, this is important, brothers and sisters, only because this is giving us not, we're not just dependent on DNA records, but we could go into history and find how the people depicted themselves. And it is among these groups that the children of Israel lived. And the children of Israel are Shemitic like them. So if the Elamites, who are descendants of Shem, can be brown and black skinned and of a lighter hue, how is it that the children of Israel wouldn't look similar across the pigmentation spectrum? I'm not here saying all Hebrew Israelites are dark brown or dark black. Some of them might look Caucasian to you or more of an Arabic or modern Iranian look to you for all I know. I'm just saying it is no denying that they are. But we know that in Africa, those who claim to descend from certain tribes in Israel are definitively people of color. And brothers and sisters, we just it's OK to admit that. Right. Isn't it OK to admit that? Yes, it's OK to admit that. Hey, thanks, Brother Hashem. He said, Ed, Ed, and edification. I appreciate that. God bless. I see, uh, hey, Brother XP, thanks for having sent that earlier as well. You see, uh, let me see if you actually sent that to my email. I still got my email open, right? Yep. Because you may have sent something there. Hold on, let me. Okay, bro, I'm looking for the email. Uh, for when you send it. Okay. Uh, what else do I want to bring up here to you all tonight? Hmm. I, I showed you that. I showed you the Elamite, the Elamite brothers. 
um, who fought in the Persian military, showed you how they depicted themselves. Amen. Um, what else do we got here? Okay, I just showed you the pictures. Let me back up. Okay. Remember, the Philistines, the Philistines who the children of Israel fought against. Let me bring that back up right quick. Was that in the ancient origins joint? Yes. Let me bring that back up because <laughs> I think it's going to be of great importance for this to be seen. Where my Phil? I'm, I'm gonna go to Wikipedia for the Philistines and just explain them right quick. Let me enlarge. The, ah, go back up top. Okay, there you go. Yeah, let me enlarge this for you all. All right. So check this out. Now, what I'm gonna do here is share the screen one more time. Sent, okay, I'm, uh, as soon as I share this source, I'm gonna open up your email and I'm just gonna share the information that you sent because you probably sent something I haven't seen before. Um, here we go, let me share the screen. Here we go. All right. Now, remember that this here lays in the temple found. Um. 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 Uh, 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 this is found in Ramesses the Third's royal palace. Him depicting what the people of different nations looked like, at least during his time. Let's say that. It says, in order, the first two are a pair of Nubians. The third individual is a Philistine. We see the two Nubians. Y'all see that third cat right there in the middle? What that man look like to y'all, man? What that look like? That's a Philistine. That's a Philistine, huh? Really? So when the children of Israel fight with the Philistines, the Elamites who are Shemitic, we just seen that they're a brown skin, a, a, a melanated people. We know that all through Africa, these are melanated peoples. So I'm showing you the children of Ham are known to be a people of color, but we're proving tonight that many descendants of Shem were also people of color. And here we have the Philistines. That man right there looked like Delroy Lindo or somebody, man. Come on, man. Look at look at bro, look at the Philistine right there in the middle, the third person from the left. That's what a Philistine looked like. Ramesses had that put on the wall. Really? Okay. Check this out. Wikipedia. The Philistines were an ancient people who lived on the south coast of Canaan from the 12th century BC until about 604, when their polity, after having already been subjugated for centuries by Assyria, was finally destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar II uh, 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 of Babylon. After becoming part of his empire and his successor, the Persian Empire, they lost their distinct ethnic identity and disappeared from the historical and archeological records by the late fifth century. So, in order to tell you what the Philistines look like, you got some joints that depict some Philistines as being a lighter hue. But brothers and sisters, did we just see what bro looked like? Ramesses got the young Philistine ball looking like him right there. Y'all see old bro right there? Looking like show enough, the show gonna Harlem. Hmm. And then right next to him is a is a, a, a Amorite. And over here, is a, 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 a Hittite on the far end. The Hittite got the lightest look of them all. So what did Uriah the Hittite possibly look like in the armies of Israel? 
What did Goliath and all of them Philistine soldiers who fought with him in the days of David, when David chopped his head off, what did they possibly look like? Y'all know what we're saying? The, this land is full of nothing. It's dominated by people of color. And I'm showing you this because the Israelites being a people of color is not something that is foreign. I'm, on, I'm, I'm bringing up an empty screen here. Let me type this in. Hold on. Here we go. Where this at? This is the Jewish virtual library. Tacitus on the Jews. Tacitus is a, hist a Roman historian from the early second century. He started his works were um were, were created around the year 110. 110. Look at this. Hold on. Hold on. I just want to find a quote. We're not going to read this whole thing. Just give me one second, brethren. I'm just trying to read and find the exact part that I want. Okay, here we go. Make it large so you all can see it with your own pupils. Here we go. Tacitus says uh, in his history on the Jews, some say the Jews were fugitives from the island of Crete who settled on the nearest coast of Africa about the time when Saturn was driven from his throne uh, by the power of whatever. Let me keep going. Uh... It says, many again say that they were a race of Ethiopian origin who in the time of King Cepheus were driven by fear and hatred of their neighbors to seek a new dwelling place. Others describe them as an Assyrian horde who not having sufficient territory took possession of part of Egypt and found cities of their own in what is called the Hebrew country. So in Roman history, he's telling you the legends about the Jews. They were said to come from the island of Crete. Some said they were an Ethiop of the Ethiopian race and others said they were of the Assyrian people. Do y'all know what that means? Tonight, I showed you what some Shemitic Assyrians would have looked like, and you also saw what Ethiopians looked like. We read in our Bible in the book of Amos chapter 9, the Most High said, are you not like the Ethiopians unto me, children of Israel? Brothers and sisters, so for this Roman historian in the second century to say, as far as when it comes to the beginning of the Jewish people, many say, there's legends where people claim that they they were a race of Ethiopian origin. What what we what what else supposed to do with that? So whoever want to be like oh whatever you just find in sources yeah I'm gonna find sources that corroborate my 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 argument and if you got a counter argument then you go and say your own hold on let me put it in here because it can't be wrong. More than likely, you left out a letter. Okay. There it is. I left it right there. You can see it, bro. Yeah, you probably spelt it wrong. It happens a lot. Sometimes people leave the Y out of my name, Zadok. You feel me? Matif Yahoo just shared it too, and I shared it. No doubt, no doubt. So now, with that being the case, once again, what are we looking at here? We are looking at proof that just lets us know 
that the children of Israel come out of this realm of people. Now, I want to I want to turn you on to what's called the mess the meshwesh. Let me share the screen one more again. Let me come from here. Don't need that now. Let me back up here. Okay, yeah, hey bro, I see your email just came through, no doubt. So now that I'm on another source again, I'll go ahead and share this once I'm finished, okay? Um, let me share the screen one more time. Okay, and boom. Okay, the Meshwesh, often abbreviated in ancient Egypt as the Ma, were an ancient Libyan tribe of Berber origin from beyond Cyrenaica. According to Egyptian hieroglyphs, which are over here, it says this area is where the Libu and Tehinu inhabited. Early records of the Meshwesh date back to the 18th dynasty of Egypt from the reign of Amenhotep III. During the 19th and 20th dynasties, Meshwesh were in almost constant conflict with the Egyptian state because out, many people don't talk about that. But outside of Egypt, outside the territory of what people call Kemet or Egypt, the larger portion of the northern part of Africa was ran by the Libyan tribes, not the tribes of Kemet, Misraim. During the late 21st dynasty, increasing numbers of Meshwesh Libyans began to settle in the western region of, the, of Egypt. They would ultimately take control of the country during the late 21st dynasty under uh, Asur Khan the Elder. After an interregnum of 38 years during which the native Egyptian kings, Siamon and Susanus II assumed the throne, the Meshwesh ruled Egypt throughout the 22nd and 23rd dynasties under powerful pharaohs like Shoshenk I, Orsic, uh, uh, um, and these are some relics of these gentlemen. Hold on, let me, let me bring this back down. So you got Orsakan. They got what they got one of his, they got a bus, one of his statues, wide nose, breathing up all the white man's air. <laughs> uh Orsakan the second. These are Egyptian relics, but these are Libyans. These are Libyan Africans who take over. And this is Orsakan the second right here seated in the middle between the deities um who else we got uh no we ain't gonna go with Shoshank. let me see what Shoshank the third bring up they just got him his relief on the wall okay just wanted to show you if you've seen them you wouldn't know you would just think egypt you wouldn't know these were libyans but what did libyans look like <laughs> here we go this right here is from a wall relief in ancient Libya, and it shows them in sports, showing their prowess fighting against wild beasts, right? What do they look like? You see the lighter skinned brother here, naked, right here at the bottom. Then you see the two darker skinned gentlemen here, Fight, they fighting lions, they got bears, they got bulls fighting, and you see the men are there holding their own, fighting against these wild beasts, depicting the power of the Libyan people and them fighting them games and proving their manliness, you know, in the rings. But I'm just showing you that when they depict themselves. Now, look at this bull. Y'all see how brown look over here, y'all. Y'all see here in this corner. I'm I know it's blurry, but just understand the, the, the color choices. Look at this. Look at this. This is a bear. The bear is brownish. Look at the bull here. Look at the color of the bull. Now look at the color of this person under the bull. And look at the color of the two men to the right who are between the bull and this lion. 
do you see that the painters of the mosaics used similar colors? So you know that the skin tone, the skin tone, said, dude got some serious glutes. <laughs> I'm just showing you that the skin tone of the people who inhabit this place, look at the color once again of the bear and the bull, the lion with his dark mane. What color, what's the skin color being depicted of these two gentlemen? They're much darker than the gentleman to the left of them. I'm just showing you this because they they did this on purpose. They're depicting what they're seeing. They're depicting themselves or those in the, you know, in their environment. So I just wanted to show that for tonight, right? Because I want to get back to the DNA, but I wanted to show you in the beginning, I used, I, I, I re-established uh, the fact that the DNA is not some 100% foolproof of who you, where your ancestors were thousands of years ago and who you exactly come from, from that time frame. They're only dealing with reference populations from now where they are in clusters and they have to go to their histories of migrations and stuff and add that with the DNA elements they can find in order to try and tell you some things about where your ancestors probably were a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago and stuff like that. So since we have proven that tonight, I wanted to show you what the people of Africa and Ethiopia and even in Canaan that the children of Israel conquered would have been looking like. And for effect, I showed you what, uh, what another Shemitic people, the Elamites, what they looked like. And ain't no way to get around that they were a dark people. So if the Elamites were a dark people and they're from Shem, Eber, one of Shem's sons, is also possibly as dark as the Elamites. And they're all going to have this color spectrum to themselves. Some of them would be Mahu. Some of them would be the hue of my bro Ashta. Some of them might be the hue of somebody like my bro Seven. The color spectrum. Then you got some of our more darker brothers. I got some brothers who are very, very dark skinned. When you talk about black folk or melanated people, it's no one shade, but we are all different shades that could be considered Negro. Do y'all know in America at one time, <laughs> That if you had any slave blood in you, you were considered a Negro. It don't matter if you looked close to the white population. If you had a grandfather who was a Negro, but you, a generation later, you 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 look, you can almost pass for white. They don't care. If you got Negro in you, you Negro to them. That was here in this country at one time. So I'm just using this tonight to give you some pictorial context to what people who dominated Northern Africa, Libya, Ethiopia, and Canaan, and even parts other parts of Mesopotamia. Brothers and sisters, it's clear that they were people of color. So the if the Hebrews were just totally this, look like these people today in the land of Israel claiming that they're the Jews, they would have been the only people dominantly looking like that because everybody they was around. And then look at this: Moses with his Ethiopian wife. Um, um, uh, 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 um, um, Joseph marrying an Egyptian daughter and having two of the tribes of Israel have the blood have Shemitic and Hamitic blood. They're mixed with the blood of Shem and Ham because Joseph is Shemitic and his wife was, I believe her name was Potiphar. She was Egyptian. So the children of Israel, we have no doubt that they were a people of color. And so people of color today claiming to believe they descend possibly from them. And then someone to just write it off and be like, no, nah, the people over there in the land of Israel, like Benjamin, Netanyahu and them, like them, like, no, nah, we, Look, it is what it is, man. So <laughs> that's all I'm going to give y'all for the night. God willing, this coming weekend, we're going to continue and we're going to go into part three because now I want to put some more DNA studies dealing with the Ashkenaz 
dealing with some of the tribes in Africa, claiming Israel descent. And let's just see what the genetic studies to this point have found so far about them claims. All right. So I'm hoping that this has been uh, edifying for you all. I'm, let me go back over here. Let me look at the chat right quick. Okay. Serious questions, eh? Where does the white tribes come from? I don't believe there are no white tribes. I believe that there are tribes th that the tribes have mixed with different people groups through time. You understand what I'm saying? That's kind. Of, that, that, that's what I. No, 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 no. Yeah, I, I don't perceive it to be racial. Just curious. And I'm going to deal with some of that because you'll start to find that some of the people who are claiming to be Jews, but they look very Caucasian. The claim is, is that their fathers would have been from the Levant, from the Middle East, but their mothers were European. <laughs> That's the claim. And I'm going to read you the studies that say exactly that. Amen. Amen. I'm definitely really appreciating these lessons and truth. Amen. Amen, sis. Bump City say, yeah, some of us going in at a designated gate and some got access to all 12 gates. Hey, that's what it is. Sister Cassandra said, in real time, I had a co-worker who's from Libya. I can confirm that he was a few shades lighter than me. Amen. I'll never forget one time. What up, young rogue? He said, I'll never forget one time this OPC pastor told me ain't no more real Jews again. <laughs> ah, that's so sad, man. That's so sad because we know that that's not true. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, I appreciate you all coming in here tonight. I pray that tonight's information kind of on a pictorial sense, letting you know where some of these people come from, us seeing how they depicted themselves or how even the people who they were enemies with depicted them. Ramesses having pictures of these different nations in his palace. He's not them. He's showing you who he's dealing with. This is what the Philistines look like when they pop up. This is what the Nubians look like. This is what the Amorites look like. This is what the uh, uh, Bedouins look like. This is what the Hittites look like. Why, well, why, why, we can't, why we can't accept that? Then you get into the Persian Empire, you go into Sushan, the palace, which is in modern day Iran. And even though today you see a whole bunch of uh, 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 more lighter shaded people, them Elamite soldiers called the immortal, the immortals on the walls, these soldiers in the Persian Empire, the Elamite soldiers called the immortals because they were such a fierce fighting force. They black, they black folk. And they, and they, from where? They are the sons of Shem. They are the sons of Shem. Who are the Hebrews? The sons of Shem. And once again, this lesson wasn't approved that everyone who would claim to be Israel gotta be dark skinned or a, 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 at least a darker caramel. No, 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 no. You might be more, a, a lighter olive, olive color. You might be more of a tan color, a more high yellow color. It's fine, but people of color nonetheless. They wasn't Caucasians, brothers and sisters. And so when you find is a, a those who would claim to be Jews, but they look more European, the claim is, is that you had those, you had men of Shemitic descent who, as they spread into Europe and other places, especially when you got the 10 tribes being scattered into modern day Afghanistan, Turkey, Uzbekistan, these is places where Bosnia and all of these places are. You could see where some Shemitics who from the 10 tribes, if they eventually started to mix and take wives from among the European women of those places that they would produce children over the generations. And then you got a son and your son is light. And now he has children with a fully more European looking woman. What would that produce? Children who you would say, yo, they look, them look like Caucasians to me. But if they daddy is an Israelite, you can't take that from them, man. So I'm not saying they're not people who look to us white, that's what we would use, and that their claims are fake. 
Whoever want to say that, let them get into that argument and prove all that. That's them. That's not me. The information I got don't sh don't show all that. But I do want to go to one source because bro did send it. So XP, I'm going to bring up your source, bro. Hold on. I'm already hollering over here. Hold on. Let me share my screen. For those of y'all, I, I, it looked like you sent this image to some other brethren, but I want to I, I want to share it with. Uh, OK. The unknown catacomb. Mm, them your fingers on that book. Boy, I got some big old fingers. Says the un <laughs> the unknown catacomb a unique discovery of early Christian art by Antonio Ferrua. Okay. Page 114, Samson slaying the lion. Okay. What they got Samson looking like here? Uh-oh. That's Samson? Mm. Wow. Wow. Definitely, you can tell. And see, when you look at pictures, you take things into context. So look at the dark shades. See see the darker shades on the outline of the man's body? And then when you look at the lion's body, any of the place that would be shadows are colored in to be darker than the actual tannish body. That Look at the hands and the facial color and the hair. Dark. Y'all see that? Wow. That's interesting. I, I've never seen this before. You got something else here. The sacrifice of Isaac. Okay. So I see, okay, this is on a wall and it's a big chunk missing out of the wall. Hmm. They got Abraham. Well, okay. It looks like, I don't know if at the bottom there, that's the, if, if that's the goat or the ram there that he's about to sacrifice in place of Isaac. He got the knife in his hand and then you see his facial feature. And, it, and, and I, I can see where someone would look at this facial feature and say, this would possibly be depicting um, a man of color. Wow, that's interesting. Hey, thanks for them images, bro. I, I, I haven't seen those ones. I appreciate that, man. Thanks a lot. Okay. So yeah, man, good looks, man. Um, Hey, God bless you all. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all supporting the kids, supporting the ministry. For those of you who might be watching this on the replay, because you weren't here live, um, basically, uh, if you want to give a financial donation to the ministry, just look at the ticker on the screen. You can hit us through the cash app. If you only, I think, not at, yeah, only live can you use the super chat here like some brothers did tonight. And uh, you can also hit us through PayPal. So with that, I'm going to say good night to you all. Most high bless you all. Until next time. Salute, salute.